Hi, my name is Rob Carolina, and in this webinar, I want to introduce you to the Law and Regulation Knowledge Area of CYBOC. In the webinar, I'm going to try to give you a basic introduction to the knowledge area. I want to explain how topics were chosen, give you some guidance on how to make best use of the material, and a very brief overview of the subjects addressed. For those of you who may have found this video without context, this knowledge area is part of a much larger project, the Cybersecurity Body of Knowledge. It forms one of 19 knowledge areas, and the entire CYBOC project report, as well as this knowledge area, are available to download for free. Here's the table of contents for the knowledge area, and I'll be talking through each of these up to section 14. So let's begin with the introduction. In assembling the topics for this knowledge area, I faced three challenges, universality, scope, and accessibility. On universality, CYBOC is meant to be presented to practitioners all around the world. Science and mathematics, as subjects, are universal. You're always trying to describe universal truth. But law and regulation, well, they're local. They differ from place to place. Secondly, scope. There's a very broad array of activities that are identified as security practice. And because the scope of activity is so broad, it tends to trigger an interest in a lot of different areas of law. Now, not all of them will be significant to every practitioner. I know some practitioners who are only concerned about one or two of these areas of law. Finally, accessibility. A real challenge in assembling this material is how to make law and regulation as a topic accessible to people who haven't previously studied law. I took the approach of creating a high-level overview of reviewing branches of law that would influence practitioner responsibility, practitioner liability, and degrees of freedom in operation. I've tried to identify some generalizable legal norms legal frameworks or legal principles that most places around the world would mostly recognize, as well as introduce issues of professional responsibility and ethics. I want to give you a framework for thinking about law. It is a discipline that is different in terms of how we conduct research and how we synthesize information. I want to help identify issues that may be of concern to practitioners and provide guidance on how to search for answers. Finally, I'm trying to describe the law as it is, not as people wish it would be. What's out of scope? I left out subjects that, although they may be important to some practitioners, they're really difficult to generalize for a global audience. Rules of evidence used by courts, similarly rules of civil procedure and criminal procedure, and criminal content laws. In each of these areas, rules tend to be very highly parochial, which is to say they don't translate well from place to place. So if we look specifically at rules of evidence, for example, if you're a forensic investigator in a particular place working with a police department, you will need to become very familiar with the rules of evidence of the place where you actually work as a policeman. But those rules might be different and will be different in other places around the world. Forensic techniques, forensic technologies, might be more widely applicable, but specific rules, well, more difficult. So I did not cover those in any detail. How to use the knowledge area? First, have a look at some key definitions. They don't always mean what you think they mean when you're talking to a lawyer. Especially look at the definitions of person, legal person, natural person. Look at the definition of state and territory, legal action and right of action. Then read the introduction. Read sections 1 and 2. No matter what your interest area is, sections 1 and 2 will help to orient you more generally to how lawyers think about law and how law applies in a multinational environment. Then have a look at whatever parts of sections 3 through 12 are most applicable to your practice needs. Each of these are meant to be roadmaps that should help you search for better answers and ask better questions. Hopefully, they'll help you understand and apply the answers that you find. Finally, everyone, I believe, should 
read sections 13 and 14. Section 13, because practitioner ethics are an important topic and they're becoming only more important as time goes on. And section 14, because I'm trying to give you some basic highlights on how to think about legal risk management. A note on terminology. In this Cybok knowledge area, Alice and Bob refer to persons, not devices. Second, please read the endnotes. There's more than 10 pages of endnotes in this knowledge area, and they're important because they don't just serve as sources of authority. They're also meant to give you, in some cases, I've used them to give you examples of how to interpret the language of the knowledge area. I've also used them to give you counterexamples. Because in law, very often it's important not just to find what we think of as the answer. You also have to find out, well, some people disagree with this, and how strong is that disagreement, or how might a disagreement apply? So the endnotes are incredibly important to help inform your understanding of what's written in the main body of the text. Do not ignore them. Finally, use the references cited for further and deeper research. Let's look at some introductory principles of law and legal research. You have to remember that law is dynamic. Yes, law influences society and members of society, but people in society also influence the development of law. Law changes, laws change, rules change over time. Secondly, there's always a degree of uncertainty in just trying to figure out what the law is at a given time. There are a wide variety of sources where you find the law and also different methods of how to interpret what you've found. Finally, when we're trying to apply law in a cyber environment, remember a couple of things. Law is about addressing the responsibility of persons and the disposition of property. Secondly, law is territorial. It's linked to geography. It is a reflection of society. Third, there is no such place as cyberspace. It's not a territory. You have to bear that in mind. And finally, increasingly, I get this question, and the answer is no. Laws do not recognize artificial intelligence as a separately defined person. I have put some references to some interesting articles that suggest perhaps about why that should or should not be done, but for the time being, the law does not recognize artificial intelligence as a separate person. I can think of only one slight counterexample, which is just not applicable for anything we're talking about. I've also, over the years, working with cybersecurity experts, realized that there is some confusion when a lawyer talks about trying to prove something. In a discussion with one of my favorite mathematicians, what, what came out was this, is that in mathematics... To prove something means to establish as a logical necessity that something is undeniable, to establish a truth beyond dispute. So here we have the Pythagorean theorem, for example. It is a theorem. Having said that, there are a number of well-known mathematical proofs of that theorem. You can prove this to a logical certainty, absolutely beyond dispute, a number of elegant proofs. In law, on the other hand, when we say we're going to prove something, we're talking about using permissible evidence to persuade a tribunal of the correctness of a disputed issue. In looking at that definition, you should immediately realize a couple of things. One of them is that some uncertainty remains inevitable. And the second thing is that we're trying to persuade correctness up to a certain degree. So an example of the proof we're talking about here comes from the Aaron Sorkin film, A Few Good Men, where Lieutenant Caffey, of course, is arguing uh, at the top of his lungs with his fellow lawyers about you know, what he has to prove. Oh, Colonel Jessup ordered the code red. Great, you have proof of that? It doesn't matter what I believe. It only matters what I can prove. That leads us neatly into a quick discussion of standards of proof. And there are quite a wide variety of these things. And I've put standards in quotation marks, because these are anything but standardized on a global basis. You find that although these phrases and words are routinely used by different courts in different locations, they can be interpreted in slightly different and sometimes surprising ways. The one that's most familiar, or two that are most familiar, I suppose, would be preponderance of evidence, which is to say greater than 50%, and that's normally the standard used in non-criminal courtroom actions. If I can prove my case, if Alice can prove her case uh, and convince a judge 
that it's more likely than not that Alice's version of events are correct, then Alice will win in a civil claim against Bob. Whereas if it's the state of Alice trying to convict Bob of a crime, then the state of Alice has to prove, normally has to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, or some other form of words that conveys a similar type of meaning. You can't really map these one-to-one onto percentage uh, degrees of certainty, so that's all approximate. Finally, I did want to introduce the idea about assessing legal risk being different from understanding legal rules. I find this is an area of confusion routinely when students come to my course from STEM subjects. Uh, Very often I'll ask the question, what is law? And a typical response will be, well, it's a series of rules that we must study and comply with, or a series of rules that someone's going to enforce against us. Well, there's a lot more to look at in terms of assessing your own legal risk from a possible legal action. So here I've laid out different ideas to try to get out the idea that you have to separate these into different categories. So the P term, Alice's relative ability to prove her case against Bob, well, the D term might then reduce the risk because Bob might have some affirmative defenses. Third, something that's very often overlooked by non-lawyers is, well, forget about the rules for a minute. What's the punishment? Or what do we suffer as a loss if Alice wins her case? So if there's very little cost, Maybe that will influence our analysis of legal risk. And finally, in the X category, something that I don't really deal with very much in this knowledge area because it's too difficult to get into, are a whole raft of additional factors that will influence this risk calculation. Willingness, resource capability, uh, things of that nature. Let's have a look at jurisdiction. In dealing with cybersecurity, we inevitably get thrown into a multinational environment. That's because the internet enables unprecedented contact between people who are in different states. Now, having said that, states have an interest in applying their own laws for the benefit of their own residents and nationals. These two points lead to three legal topics that become incredibly important. The first is jurisdiction scope of state authority, and that's the subject of this section of the knowledge area. Second is the subject of private international law, what lawyers also call conflict of law. And that answers the question, what state law or laws will apply when parties connected to different states are arguing with each other? Now, I have discussed private international law, but specifically within the context of individual rules. So section six, for example, talks a bit about private international law for contracts, seven for torts, eight for intellectual property, and 10 in the context of dematerialized documentation and trust services. Third, it triggers a question of public international law, the area that regulates actions among and between different states. So getting back down to just jurisdiction, think of jurisdiction in three different categories, prescriptive, juridical, and enforcement. Now, in this knowledge area, I haven't spent very much time at all on juridical jurisdiction. It's a little bit too technical to get into. I have cited a couple of things you can look at. Mostly, I'm talking about prescriptive and enforcement jurisdiction. Looking at prescriptive jurisdiction, we find that lawmakers routinely adopt laws that apply to people and activities that are outside the territory of their state. There's various theories that have been adopted to endorse this type of practice, the effects doctrine and some others that I don't get into terribly much. But as a practitioner, you just need to know that this happens. With respect to cybersecurity, some of the most common examples of prescriptive jurisdiction of activities outside territory would be laws that apply to offshore content that is visible inside the territory, offshore hackers who attack in territory systems, or most significantly for many of you, offshore data controllers who process personal data that relates to in-territory data subjects. And of course, there I'm talking about data protection and GDPR, which will come up later in this webinar. If we then look at enforcement jurisdiction, this is the area of jurisdiction where things get, well, a bit dramatic from time to time. Because here we're really talking about the police power of the state, the ability of the state to project its will over persons and property. So here are a variety of enforcement jurisdiction tools that are used. And I suppose if we were to further break these down, 
you could look at them as things that a state does within its own territory and things that a state will ask another state to do for it. So if we look at this in terms of asset seizure and forfeiture, for example, there we're talking about seizing domestic assets, which might be server infrastructure, or for that matter, it might be the seizure of a domain name when the domain name registrar is located in territory. In terms of what's located in territory, I've got some material in here about what we can think of as the location of a bank account, because even a dematerialized bank account eventually can be said to have a location. On the other hand, this next topic, foreign enforcement of domestic civil judgments, here's a circumstance where one state essentially asks another state to enforce a rule that a judge has issued. And here I'm talking only about non-criminal court actions. Foreign enforcement of domestic judgments is, usually, is something that we really only talk about in the context of non-criminal actions. So if Alice in state A sues Bob in state B, and the state A court issues a judgment, then Alice might have to get on a plane and go to state B and ask state B court to enforce the judgment. When we talk about arresting people, though, that's sort of normally something that happens when the person is present in the state. If the person is outside, well, that's where we look at extradition. We ask another state to extradite. Also, as an enforcement mechanism, as we get more technologically oriented, think about technological means to filter content on a geographic basis. Now, yes, there are some very dramatic statewide examples of a state mandating technological filters at the border, but there's also a lot of activity by content providers in terms of limiting how their content is distributed. Sometimes that's done for licensing purposes or to segment territory. Sometimes it's done as a compliance tool. So a lot of people who have material served up from their own systems will, of their own accord, try to filter access from certain states because they're trying to comply with those other states' laws or they don't want to get into difficulty with the other state. You can also get into orders addressed to domestic persons to produce data under their control wherever located. And of course, that is a reference to the famous Microsoft case uh, decided within the last few years about um, data stored in Ireland, but under the control of people in the U.S. And finally, international legal assistance. And this is where the police of one state are asking for assistance from the police of another state in pursuing an investigation. Those types of enforcement points, particularly things like the Microsoft case, lead to a discussion of the data sovereignty problem. And I suppose the simplest statement is outlined here. The cloud provides a sense of location independence. Now, that's not the same thing as actual location independence. And we observe that states increasingly exercise enforcement jurisdiction based on the location of data infrastructure. That leads to the result that a large and growing number of states are imposing a wide variety of so-called data localization requirements. That appears to be the trend, and so I've written a bit about this as well. Let's turn briefly to privacy laws in general and electronic interception. There are some issues in privacy law that are agreed internationally. They are widely accepted by states around the world. The first is that privacy is a human right. In terms of how far that privacy extends, there seems to be widespread agreement that privacy includes privacy in electronic communications. As recently as 30 to 50 years ago, that wasn't the case, but is now widely accepted. What is also widely accepted, and I find that practitioners don't always appreciate this, is that the right to privacy is conditional, not absolute. There are a number of significant issues where there is a lack of agreement among and between states about privacy. First, with respect to scope, where, when, and how do you have an expectation of privacy? Secondly, what conditions justify an invasion of the privacy you would normally expect. The right to privacy is conditional, so what are the conditions that justify an invasion? Third, what process is used to decide when and how those conditions are fulfilled? 
Will it be a judicial process, an executive process, formal, informal, levels of review? No international agreement on that. Finally, what differences in privacy rights apply if we're talking about intrusions undertaken by the state as opposed to intrusions by non-state actors? If we do look specifically at the topic of state interception or lawful access, what we find is that legal systems around the world are highly heterogeneous, and there's not a lot of agreement on how they should be structured. That makes them very difficult to compare with one another, and it makes it very difficult to try to abstract out generally applicable principles. Now, by contrast, there is some international agreement on technical standards. States will follow their own laws governing interception, governing lawful access. And the U.S. is especially complicated on this point because you have U.S. federal law, which talks about lawful access, as well as state law that deals with uh, lawful access. And the number of statutes, the number of different laws that apply in the U.S. is blindingly complex. When we look at these various types of laws that deal with lawful access, there are some things that seem to be commonplace. So, for example, service providers are typically required to invest in facilities that will aid lawful access and to provide some degree of technical assistance when the state comes knocking and demands lawful access. Different states impose varying degrees of secrecy about the lawful access process. And you can see this in transparency reports by multinational telecommunications service providers where they try to disclose how many interception requests they get in a given year from a given state. And some places they're able to give a lot of detail about how many they receive. And in some places they just note, we're not allowed to say anything in the state X or state Y about what types of lawful access requests we get from those locations. What is universally secret with lawful access requests is the question of whose line are we tapping, whose email are we reading, who, in other words, is the target of the interception investigation. When we look to interception undertaken by non-state actors, again, we find that legal systems are heterogeneous. They, They differ from place to place. And in this case, the restrictions might vary significantly based on the relationship between the person doing the intercepting and the target. If a person is running a public telecommunications service, then it's normally the case that they are prohibited from intercepting message content that's being carried over their service network. At the same time, people who operate so-called private systems, you know, local area networks, things of that nature, especially when they're employers, are often given some flexibility to intercept traffic subject to a variety of legal rules. That leads us into data protection. Data protection is a series of legal restrictions on the collection, disclosure, and use of personal data. In the world today, European Union law, specifically GDPR, is the most influential example of data protection law. It's not the only one. Many countries around the world, many states around the world, have laws that are either described as data protection laws or operate in a very similar fashion. Australia, New Zealand, Israel, Japan, China, all these jurisdictions have some type of data protection law, but the European Union's is the most influential. Data protection is more than just a law about privacy. It's kind of grown up out of privacy laws over the decades, but data protection law is an attempt to provide some measure of control to living data subjects about how their personal data is used. It's my opinion for various reasons that data protection law is really a reaction to the birth and growth of the modern administrative nation state and the modern enterprise. If you're talking about data protection, you might as well use the specific terms of art that describe the key players in the data protection regulation game. Data subject, data controller, data processor. The data subject, of course, is the natural person to whom personal data relates. A data controller 
is the person who controls the dissemination of personal data, dissemination or other processing, let's say. The data processor, on the other hand, is a person who's merely processing personal data under the instruction of a data controller. When data protection law first started many decades ago, lawmakers thought that they were regulating people who ran computer systems. So a lot of regulatory focus was on what we now call the data processor. Let's figure out where computers are. Let's get a list of them, get, get a list of people who run computer systems and find out what that's about. Well, as computers became ubiquitous, as everyone began to have a computer or tens or thousands or hundreds of thousands of computers under their control, the regulation shifted focus and people realized no, really, the person we want to focus on is the data controller. After all, they're the ones making substantive decisions about how data will be processed. The focus shifted significantly in the direction of the data controller. Now, more recently in GDPR, regulatory focus has come back out again to the data processor because what people have realized is that in the modern age, a lot of data processors are people offering cloud-based services, especially software as a service. And in that kind of service architecture, the data controller might be buying the service, but they're not necessarily specifying how the service is going to operate. The data processor is doing that. So in GDPR, there's a uh, now, once again, a much more balanced approach to obligations between these two parties. What is actually regulated? Okay, if you're going to figure out whether or not data protection law applies to a particular problem, then you need to know whether or not you're processing personal data. So here we have the definition from GDPR on what's meant by processing. And as you read the language here, I think you will agree that this constitutes almost anything you could possibly imagine doing the data. Collecting it, uh, recording it, disclosing it, analyzing it, deleting it, erasing it, destroying it. All, all these things that you might or might not do with data all constitute the act of processing. The question naturally becomes, are we processing personal data? All right. So personal data is data concerning a living individual. Personal data includes data capable of being attributed to a living individual by any person, even if that person is unknown to you, even if it's somebody else. In practice, this means that pseudonymous data, encrypted data, any data capable of de-anonymization by anybody anywhere is personal data. It's not enough to say, but I can't. If, you, if you're trying to figure out, are you a data controller, controlling or data processor, processing personal data, and you look at the data set and you say, well, I don't see any personal information in there. That's not the test. The test is whether or not there is anybody out there in the world who is capable of attributing this data to a living person. This leads to what I think is one of the biggest areas of confusion that I've seen in cybersecurity over the past decade. And that is the slow erosion of the use of the word personal data, phrase personal data, replacing it with PII, or personally identifiable information. So I've drawn a kind of a Venn diagram to try to tease out this, uh, this distinction, and I've written about this extensively in Cybok because it is such a source of common confusion. If we look at the definition of personal data in the law of the European Union and other places, and then we compare it with the definitions of personally identifiable information, PII, found in technical standards, ISO 29100 or NIST 800-122, I think if you read those definitions, it's kind of difficult to see how terribly different they are necessarily. Certainly the ISO and NIST definitions embrace the idea that something remains PII even if you can't tell the identity of the person involved. And so these relationships in this particular Venn diagram are a bit, uh, let's say, imprecise. It's not entirely clear how they overlap. However, we then get to a very big problem. And that is the phrase personally identifiable information has been used in the statutory language of a number of laws in the United States. Um, going back at least as far as the late 1980s, a very famous law, uh, 
that specifically regulated what you could do or could not do with the records of rental video rental records. This was, of course, back in the day when you would walk into a shop and ask for a VHS tape, and the rental company would keep a record of what you had rented. And there were some questionable practices uh, by, uh, by some folks at that time, and so a law was passed. And the phrase that they use in that law is personally identifiable information. That phrase kind of stuck, and so it began to be used in a lot of other U.S. laws. But the definition that's been adopted by the U.S. Congress in a number of different laws is not necessarily the same as the definition given in the technical standards above. So we've seen, for example, some cases brought against uh, folks like Netflix trying to apply this old 1980s law about video rental records to data that's being collected by Netflix and the court trying to figure out what does or doesn't apply. Now, in those circumstances, we've had U.S. courts who've decided that personally identifiable information means kind of what it sounds like, and that is, if I can identify someone by just looking at the data, that makes it PII. And if I can't identify someone just by looking at the data, then it's not PII. Now, bear in mind, those are definitions of U.S. laws by U.S. courts, and their purpose in interpreting those laws is to try to figure out what did Congress intend to do. That has nothing whatsoever to do with the technical standards. That has nothing whatsoever to do with the definition of personal data. So this causes a lot of confusion when you have cybersecurity practitioners, especially those who are familiar with the U.S. system or who are working with U.S. companies, who get to this question of, do we have PII in our system? Well, for legal purposes, that might not in any way be important if you're worried about data protection law. This isn't the end of the problem, though. There is a much smaller universe of PII that I describe as the definition that we all talk ourselves into believing because we end up in multiple committee meetings at an organization where somebody in the organization invariably says, well, do we have a compliance issue here? Well, only if there's personal data. All right. Then somebody says, well, do we have PII? That's mistake number one, because you're now asking the wrong question. And now that we start talking about PII, people go all around the table and they say, well, I don't know, do you, can you identify anybody from this data set? Do you know? Well, I'm not sure if that's it. Well, I can't identify anyone. And eventually everyone just kind of tries to persuade themselves that, you know, no, we're not going to have to do a compliance analysis here because we've just persuaded ourselves that this is PII. Now, in the text of Cyboc, I've spent just a very brief amount of time talking about the core data protection principles, things like fair use, fair and lawful use of personal data, the retention principle. And I haven't spent too much time on it because there are a lot of good quality resources available for practitioners. And I've cited to a few of them that I, I think are good. They've been published, for example, by the, the European Union itself and many others that have uh, that have been that have been written that are worth looking at. I have highlighted briefly that if you're involved in the investigation and prevention of crime, there are some uh, additional things that you want to look at. Now, obviously, if you're working for a state, if you're in the police service, then there's a different body or related body of law you have to look at, not GDPR. You would then be looking at the directive that was adopted at the same time. But I then spend a bit more time talking about the concept of appropriate security measures and the assessment and design of processing systems, you know, because these are the kinds of subjects that I find security practitioners get involved in much more deeply. If you want to become a data protection compliance person, just know that there's a lot more that you need to address that goes beyond security measures. Similarly, international data transfer comes up quite a bit, and it's often a source of confusion. So I've spent some time talking about the adequacy decision uh, mechanism used by the European Union, and also data breach notification. Now, in this context, I've made some references to the law of U.S. states, who were some of the first people in with data breach notification rules, and I've then talked in detail about the rules that were adopted under GDPR and made uh, that became effective in 2018. Finally, I mentioned enforcement penalties. This has really, more than anything else, triggered a lot of focus 
on data protection. The number one thing that has elevated data protection to a sort of, let's say, a tier one risk that organizations want to think about are not substantive changes to the rules, but changes to the penalty involved. And as you can see, there have been some really eye-wateringly large fines proposed for violating GDPR. Okay, let's look briefly at the subject of computer crime. Computer crime really brings up three different possibilities. Either the internet is an instrumentality of some other crime, or we're talking about a crime based on message content, or we're talking about a crime against information systems themselves. I haven't written about the internet as instrumentality because otherwise we'd be writing about every possible crime on the face of the earth. Uh, and I think that just kind of rapidly spins out of control. I also haven't really written at all extensively about content of message crimes. And that's because it's extremely difficult. This is a very sensitive topic and it's very difficult to abstract out international norms in this particular space because there's always a tension between a given society's desire to limit illicit message content and their desire to promote freedom of expression about the only place where you find international agreement these days on message content has to do with content that is the uh, concerning abuse of children and i have made a, a, a brief reference to that but mostly what i've used this section for is to explain a bit more about crimes against information systems and as you can see they fall into five categories improper access to a system Usually, this is synonymous with the term hacking, the idea of trying to break into a computing system of some type without authorization. Improper interference with data, which is to say, you know, rearranging, deleting, uh, messing about with the contents of a computer. Improper interference with systems. Now, here we have anything that would decrease service viability, denial of service attacks. Improper interception of communication. Now, we've already talked about that and producing hacking tools with improper intentions. There are a number of recurring challenges that come up with these types of crimes. First, lack of universality. Not every state in the world agrees that these things should be criminal. Secondly, extradition. It's very well known that there have been cases where it's difficult to gain extradition of somebody because they have committed a crime against an information system. The third point here is how do you measure harm with respect to these types of crimes against information systems? In some systems, for example, the crime is conceptualized as an economic crime and the punishment to be meted out and the severity of the crime is directly related to how much financial damage you can demonstrate was done by the, by the criminal. Whereas others don't seem to operate that way. And since we have difficulty measuring harm, that leads on to problems of should we have de minimis exceptions and uh, should there be other types of exceptions to these laws? So f on, on the right-hand side of the slide, for example, should we have exceptions built in for research and development activities. Other problems that come up on a recurring basis, warranted state interception. If you give a state agent a warrant to intercept communications, by extension, they're probably also breaking into a computer somewhere, or they might be breaking into a computer, or do you want them to be able to break into a computer in order to execute that interception warrant? This comes up again in public international law. Finally, a recurring issue in this area of law is so-called self-help especially hackback. Generally speaking, we can say that the law doesn't like self-help. Self-help is just the process of, if you want to enforce your rights, do it yourself. Don't bother to call the police. Don't bother to go to a law court. Just take the law into your own hands and enforce the law yourself. That's usually, for a lot of very good policy reasons, not encouraged. And hackback is an example of self-help, where somebody says, well, I'm being attacked, so I want to turn that back around. So I've written a little bit about, and I've given citations to a number of really thought-provoking articles on this subject of hackback. Let's look now at the law of contract. Contract describes a legal relationship between persons. The simplest definition I've found is a contract is a promise or a series of promises that the law will enforce. 
contract does not describe a piece of paper. This often causes confusion where people get focused on the paper, the signature. No, the contract is the relationship. And finally, as an introductory comment on contract, at least in common law systems, remember that only someone who is a party to a contract normally has the right to enforce that contract against another party. We call this the rule of privity. This becomes important, especially if you're going to look at trust services and trying to figure out how to use contract mechanisms to rationalize liability. I wanted to take a slightly different approach in this webinar to the way that the subject matter is laid out in Cybok. So if you look at Cybok, you'll find a discussion of contracts in an online environment for people who have to design secure online trading platforms. And you'll find a legal discussion about warranties and exclusion of warranties and limitations of liability, uh, breach of contract and remedies, and conflicts of law, of course. The thing I want to focus on in this webinar is using contract to encourage security behaviors. So when we talk about using contract to encourage security behaviors, whose behavior are we talking about? Very often I find it boils down to one of two types of person, either someone in a supply chain relationship, or we're talking about participants in a trading or a payment system. What types of contract mechanisms are used? The simple ones, promises to comply with security standards, or promises to notify in the event of incidents, to grant audit rights, and similar things. You get the idea. What's actually at risk, though, where these contracts are concerned? If a party is going to breach one of these promises, if they break one of these promises, what do they have at risk? Well, the highest risk in breaking these promises might be the loss of the value of a trade or the value of a payment. This is the case where people are participating in a trading platform or a payment system. In terms of medium or lower risk, what does a party face if they break their word? That might be a loss of relationship. They could be facing a legal action for breach of contract. Are those really effective threats? Or put differently, how significant is the influence that those mechanisms are going to have? Why is it that there are limits on the ability of a contract to influence behavior? In short, it may be that breaching a contract doesn't cost very much. This could be because of a low quantum of provable loss. It might be that a disappointed party isn't willing to bring a legal action. There might be technical problems involving privity or something else. It could be that a party can't prove that a security violation caused a financial loss. Consider, for example, all the cases of breach notification. Someone gets a breach notification from a given organization. Three months later, they're the victim of identity theft. Can they really demonstrate on the balance of probabilities that the identity theft was caused by that particular loss of data? That's going to be hard. There might be other legal reasons why liability is limited. It could be limitations and exclusions imposed in the contract itself. Finally, in the supply chain example, it could be that a party is unwilling to pursue action because they have no credible alternative source of supply. This is a very common problem in outsourcing. I suggest that the ability of a contract to influence behavior is dependent on the subject matter of the contract itself. So if security is a foundation in reducing some much larger commercial risk, the contract will probably have a strong influence over behavior. The best example I can think of would be contracts within payment systems. A failure to comply with security measures means that a party might risk losing the entire value of a trade or of merchandise that's been delivered. Areas where the contract might have a medium influence would be those where security is the subject matter of other goods or services supplied. If a vendor is supplying security devices or security services to a sophisticated customer, they have a very strong incentive to try and comply with contract terms. But even here, they will have some flexibility for negotiation 
or certainly an opportunity to try to make things better if something goes wrong. The vast majority of contracts, I suspect, will fall into this last category where the contract is having only a weak influence over security behaviors. This is because the subject matter of the contract is not necessarily security itself. We're talking here about supply of routine software and hardware, cloud services, other goods and services. Security might be an encouraged feature. It might be an encouraged behavior, but it's not the core subject matter of the contract. And a party delivering goods and services in those circumstances will know this. They'll know this when they negotiate, and they'll know this during the operational phase of the contract relationship. And because of the limitations discussed in the last slide, a counterparty will realize that the cost of breaking their security promises might be very low. Let's have a look at the law of tort. A tort is just a civil wrong other than breach of contract. The concept of tort is based on social responsibility. The idea that somebody who commits a tort, we call that person the tort feeser, is required to compensate a victim. There are many different types of tort, and in this section of Cybok, I've written about the two that I think are most significant, the law of negligence and strict liability for defective product. There are many other types of tort. The tort most people will be familiar with is the tort of negligence. Now, whether or not negligence exists is usually a function of two different questions. Does that person owe a duty of care to the victim? And have they fulfilled or breached their duty to the victim? It's helpful if you tease these out and look at them separately. First of all, when does one person owe a duty of care to another? One core concept that comes up time and time again is this idea of foreseeability. If you think of a given activity that somehow revolves around cybersecurity, ask yourself the question, if I'm not careful in what I'm doing, who might be harmed as a result outside my immediate sphere or people outside my company, people in other places around the world? Who might suffer some type of loss? As soon as you can imagine that kind of connection, that's a strong indicator that you might owe a duty of care to that foreseeable victim. I've given a number of examples for you to consider in a table in this section. I'm not suggesting that all of these parties always owe duties of care all the time, but nonetheless, I would urge you to have a look at it and think through when you're making decisions as a practitioner, if I get this wrong, who might suffer? If you owe a duty of care to another person, the law doesn't normally hold you to a standard of perfection. After all, negligence is about finding fault. There's a recognition that sometimes accidents happen, sometimes bad things happen, and it's not your fault. So we don't ask people to act perfectly, we ask them to act reasonably. Now that, of course, leads to a problem. How do you prove that someone has acted unreasonably? What is a victim supposed to do? The concept of acting reasonably or unreasonably is one that a judge or a jury will assess by reference to whatever social framework they've got at the time. When I'm in a room full of cybersecurity practitioners and I describe a case study where someone has made a decision or someone has carried out a cybersecurity activity, and I ask the question, do you, a room full of practitioners, believe that this person acted reasonably or unreasonably? It's interesting to see how often the people in the room will converge to a single opinion. The problem with that standard, though, is that it just suggests that so long as we all do the same thing, so long as we all convince ourselves that what we're doing is the right thing, then maybe that's enough. And, of course, people have commissioned any number of studies, best practice studies, asking the question, what do people in my position in other companies do? Now, why are those studies commissioned? Because people are trying to get a sense of how much am I required to do? We're trying to find out, are we acting reasonably? Now, that leads to a problem. If everybody in a given environment is slow to change, if the environment around you is changing, 
but you and other people in your group are not changing with the times, that could lead to a situation where everyone is really not doing right as that is defined in a given place in a given time. A famous U.S. judge in the 1930s was confronted with a case like this. Someone towing a barge did not have a working radio. And the question was, why don't you have a working radio? And the answer is, well, none of our competitors, most of the people in our industry are not required to have them. And the judge came up with this observation. Common practice is not the same as reasonable practice. Just because everybody else is doing it, just because you're right in the median of that bell-shaped curve from a best practice study, does not necessarily mean you're going to get away without liability if something goes wrong. That same judge later was asked to try to give some guidance on, well, how do we know when we have to shift? How do we know when it's time to jump into the next new technology, into the next new operating procedure? And he put together what is kind of a cost-benefit analysis, where he said, if the burden of this new technology, the burden of this new methodology, is less than the harm you're trying to avoid, and that's the probability of loss multiplied by the amount of the loss, then you have an obligation to pick up that new technology. You have an obligation to take on that new methodology. Very famous cases. You can read about them. There's been a lot written about these. Those two frameworks that I've just given you are essentially static. The rules that I've just described about does one person, uh, you know, a, a duty of care, do they owe a duty of care to another party? Have they acted reasonably? Those basic concepts have not changed very much in hundreds of years, but nonetheless, they produce dynamic results. The results change. Why? Because if we look at duty of care, for example, our concept of foreseeability grows with experience. As we get more experience in the world of cybersecurity, we begin to see circumstances where our mistakes might create harm for other people. Similarly, our concept of what is reasonable also changes. It's also grounded in social expectation. So both of these things change over time, and both of these things can differ from society to society. Now, some people look at that and they say, hey, I don't think I'm going to have a problem because I live in a place, I live in a society where the courts are not very aggressive. We don't have a liability society. That's just for the common law people. It's just for the folks in California. Do be careful. If you do find yourself sued under a theory of negligence, your conduct may well be measured by the standards of the territory where the victim is located. And that's because of private international law. And there's a note on that in Section 7. Product liability, or more accurately, strict liability for defective products, is very different from negligence. Under certain circumstances, we want to hold a manufacturer liable if they have created an unsafe product, and that unsafe product results in death or personal injury. In this area of the law, the focus has moved from fault of persons to flaws in a product. So it's no defense to a product liability claim to say that we spent a lot of time on engineering, we spent a lot of time trying to make the product safe. Trying really hard is not good enough in this area of law. Originally, when I started teaching legal aspects of cybersecurity, I wasn't terribly concerned with product liability because it's limited to discussions of death or personal injury. As the Internet of Things has become an increasing phenomenon, though, this area of law is starting to become more relevant. People are thinking about this area of law much more often. Why? Because we've entered an age where cybersecurity failures can lead to personal injury or death. The most common case that people like to talk about is what about self-driving automobiles that go wrong somehow? But on a more simple example, you could just look at a remote-controlled thermostat. If somebody were to break into that and alter the temperature of a home of a vulnerable individual, that could result in personal injury or death. Remember, though, that strict liability for defective products only applies to products as defined in this area of law, and software on its own is not defined as a product. So here's how this works out. 
if somebody creates unsafe software or software that has a flaw and that software is then inserted into a piece of hardware which is sold as a product and the resulting hardware product is unsafe then whoever manufactures and sells that hardware product will be strictly liable for having sold an unsafe product but the supply chain partner who produced only software will not be strictly liable under this theory of law this is one of the reasons why in manufacturer products that have complex supply chains a lot of attention is given to contractual negotiations about how to shift this liability back and forth with torts generally it's up to the victim to prove that they have suffered what we would call a cognizable loss a loss that the law will compensate and they have to demonstrate that that loss was caused by the tort feasors action so the tort itself has to be causally linked to the loss that's provable and there are cases especially in cybersecurity where proving that can be a serious challenge now remember anytime a victim has a serious challenge proving a loss going back to our risk equation that probably lowers the potential for risk to the tort feasor because of difficulty in calculating damages in some circumstances occasionally lawmakers will simply write out a tariff of compensation under certain defined circumstances this happens for example in the u.s where certain types of copyright infringement can be subject to so-called statutory damages and also in the state of illinois when they passed their law concerning use of biometrics violation of that law results in statutory uh, damages of fixed amounts also if you're going to be in contact with the u.s legal system you must take care to remember about the possibility for punitive or exemplary damages these are special damage awards designed specifically to punish let's say especially careless behavior or sometimes indifference to human suffering and those types of awards can be many many multiples of the underlying award for quantum of loss within torts generally when you have more than one tort feaser or more than one party involved in committing the tort there are a number of different rules about attributing and apportioning liability i've mentioned two here the first is vicarious liability the most common place you encounter vicarious liability is when an employee does something negligently or commits a tort if that tort is committed by the employee within the course of their business then the employer becomes strictly liable to compensate the victim the case that i've cited here is one that i mentioned in cybok i mention it here because after version 1.0 of cybok was published the uk supreme court did make a change in this area of law it's not a significant change for purposes of analyzing what can go wrong because the court did confirm that yes vicarious liability can apply in data protection law that's not terribly surprising but they said if we look specifically at the at what happened in this case and it's an interesting case i would recommend you have a look at it the employee the internal auditor who violated data protection law was not acting in the scope of his employment when he undertook this malicious act he basically disclosed everybody's uh, personal data to the world he was specifically trying to be malicious he was off said the supreme court he was off on a frolic when an employee is not acting within the scope of their employment then vicarious liability doesn't apply so yes this doctrine does apply to data protection law no surprise there but in this particular case the employee was off on a frolic because he was acting maliciously not within the scope of his employment secondly i've mentioned joint and several liability and as i've said here a small percentage of joint responsibility can lead to a hundred percent of liability how does that happen imagine if there's more than one joint tortfeasor let's say your company and a second company are both involved in doing something that harms an individual or a group of individuals financially or in some other way well you can say i'm only partly responsible so we have to share responsibility what if the other party goes bankrupt or what if the other party can't be found and drawn into court joint and several liability is the doctrine that says 
even if you only caused part of the problem, you might end up having to pay all of the liability. Now let's look at the section on intellectual property. So let's begin with this. Intellectual property is simply a series of negative rights, the right to tell people to stop doing things. Owning intellectual property does not guarantee you any freedom to act. I often try to explain them as a series of red cards that you can show to others to say, stop doing this or stop doing that or stop doing the other. Within Cybok, I've provided a very short catalog of the four most significant intellectual property rights that you're likely to run into as a cybersecurity practitioner. Copyright, obviously very important uh, in the field of software. Patents, or even patents as we say. Surprisingly important also in the field of software and very important for security product developers. Trademark, important to study, especially if you're worried about domain names. And trade secret is an intellectual property right commonly relied upon in the cybersecurity field. I wanted to focus briefly on one issue that comes up with some regularity in cybersecurity, and that is the problem of reverse engineering. Now, reverse engineering historically has been accepted as normal behavior, and here we're talking about tearing a product down to try to figure out how it's been designed, how it's been put together, to try to figure out secret methodologies that a competitor hasn't want to publish. The reason that reverse engineering has been accepted as normal is that, after all, it doesn't invalidate any patent rights, it doesn't invalidate copyright protection. So if you pull a competitor's product to bits, and you discover a series of things, if that competitor has already taken out a patent, then there's nothing about your reverse engineering that reduces those rights. What successfully reverse engineering a product will do, however, is destroy any trade secret protection that might be inherently involved inside the product. This status quo was really challenged by changes to copyright law around the turn of the 21st century. And that was the time when policymakers around the world decided that they wanted to expand copyright law to prohibit people trying to circumvent copyright protection technology. That makes life very difficult for some researchers, and I've spoken about that in Cybok particularly researchers who want to study things like digital rights management. You have to be extraordinarily careful because many of these provisions that prohibit circumvention of copyright protection technologies operate on a hair trigger and you can find yourself very quickly crossing into liability and sometimes even criminal liability through what you might otherwise think of as legitimate research tasks. And finally, Anyone involved in cryptography research will be familiar with the problem of trying to test what is otherwise a proprietary cryptographic algorithm. In other words, a cryptographic methodology that someone's trying to keep as a trade secret. And here I have linked to some descriptions of the Megamos crypto case, which went through the UK courts in the early 2010s. That case is extremely interesting because it talked about the problem of researchers who had reverse engineered a product in an effort to pull out the proprietary cryptographic algorithm because they wanted to test the strength of the algorithm. Well, it turns out that what they reverse engineered might itself have been the results of a trade secret violation. At least that's what was alleged. And these researchers wanted to publish the results of their findings. And they found themselves in difficulty because the owner of the trade secret decided that they wanted to intervene and try to prohibit the publication in a manner that would violate their trade secret. You can read more about that. Let's turn briefly to the subject of internet intermediaries, shields from liability and takedown procedures. This subject arises because of a decision made by policymakers around the world back in the 1990s to shield certain types of people from liability based on the content of messages carried in their networks or the content of messages stored on their systems. The first most obvious example of this were internet service providers and telecommunications companies. The concerns expressed by those companies were this. 
we want to build an operational internet, but we, the internet service providers, cannot do that if we're going to face liability for, let's say, copyright infringement or defamation or criminal liability for distribution of obscenity based on our network. We don't have any way of understanding what's going across our network in a significant way. So shields were adopted. You can find the most accessible version of these probably in the European Union e-commerce directive sections 12, 13, and 14. While shielding certain people from liability in the 1990s was widely thought of as a great idea, as time has moved on, the subject has become, well, increasingly contentious. And here we've seen the more recent adoption in the U.S. of the so-called FOSTA-SESTA legislation, which starts to chip away with major exceptions to these liability shields. There's also an ongoing debate about whether these types of shields should apply to social media platforms or search platforms. Now, the reason that I've included this stuff in Cybok is primarily because it has spawned an entire business process of dealing with takedown requests. Takedown requests are requests sent to some sort of intermediary that says, it's come to my attention that infringing material is on one of your servers. Please get rid of it. Now, the reason that takedown requests are important is because they trigger a clock. If the receiving party does not take down offending content expeditiously, then they lose the benefit of their liability shield, and at that point, they might face liability for the content of what they have failed to remove. Now, bear in mind, not everybody is required to take down content. So in Europe, for example, someone who is an internet service provider, if someone writes a letter to an internet service provider and it says it's come to our attention that copyright infringing material is going across your network, well, of course it is. That seems to be inevitable. So under Article 12 of the e-commerce directive, for example, it's not a requirement for those types of people offering that type of service to take down or stop movement of content. However, if you are a hosting services provider, as defined, then you do have that obligation. And similar provisions exist in U.S. copyright law, particularly with respect to hosting services. Although people like internet service providers are not required to monitor their core network for offending traffic on a minute-by-minute -minute or day-by-day -day basis, they can still be ordered by a court or by some other arm of the state to block or filter traffic. In Britain, for example, there was a well-known case where rights owners were unable to get the courts in a place where a server was located to remove offending material from the server. They were claiming copyright infringement. A lot of that infringing material was entering the United Kingdom. Now, the reason for the difference is because copyright laws worked differently between the two places. British copyright law was more restrictive. So being unable to influence the activities of the hosting organization, the rights owners actually asked the British court to send an order to the British internet service provider, the largest one in the country, and saying, please block access to that server. Now, a block like that is obviously not perfect, but the court felt, well, it's good enough for now. That's the most effective remedy for these folks. And that's what happened. There are obviously many more dramatic examples of sovereign states issuing orders to their internet service providers to block various types of content from time to time. So you might find those orders not necessarily coming from a court, they might come from a ministry of justice or a home office, or they might just be done by executive direction, depending on the country. I want to turn our attention to the problem of dematerialization of documents and electronic trust services. Once upon a time, we had lots of experience with documents. We had vellum, paper, signatures, seals, fingerprints, witnesses. We had centuries of experience in developing forensic techniques for the purpose of detecting forgery. Then came dematerialization. Documents and messages move into an entirely electronic format 
This had the effect of destabilizing our understanding as a society of how to test authenticity and integrity of documents. There were two very different responses to this. The first came with the original EDI networks, and that is, well, let's stick a trusted intermediary in the middle of a trading network. That way, we will have an organization who is neutral, and they will act like an umpire or a referee, and they will keep a copy of all messages, and if anything goes wrong, they will hold the authoritative record of what was said and when. That's how we will guarantee authenticity of the message, because that central party will have its own security procedures, and how we will guarantee integrity of messages, because that central party will keep a certified copy of those messages. EDI networks have been around for half a century, and they are still very successful. They're very expensive to set up, but they can work very efficiently. If you have any questions about that, all you have to do is look at things like airline reservation systems or SWIFT, the International Funds Transfer Network. As technology moved along, though, people started looking for different types of solutions, solutions that were easier to adopt or more widespread. And as computing technology became ubiquitous, as everybody got a general purpose computer that had quite a lot of processing power, and as telecommunications networks became more accessible, bandwidth became accessible, people started to communicate with each other over networks. A wide array of security solutions, technological solutions, came into the market with the promise that we have a solution that will help guarantee authenticity of messages and integrity of messages. A lot of those technologies, I would say most of those technologies, were based on some type of public key infrastructure, although you could argue that some of the technologies are really founded on symmetric key. I don't want to get into that discussion right now. Once those solutions came into the market, people began to realize there were a series of legal challenges that had to be overcome. And I've identified four of the basics right here. The first, can we admit into evidence this electronic document, this electronic message? Will courts be prepared to read it? In the early days of computing, this was viewed as a major problem because courts had difficulties knowing whether or not they could or should trust digital evidence. But by the time we'd gotten to the 1980s and early 1990s, many courts around the world had become comfortable with this idea, and there were sort of a few holdouts in developed countries, but this problem started to move away. Secondly, requirements of form. Many times a communication, in order to be legally effective, must follow some prescribed form. Not all the time, but when these problems come up, they are quite severe. So some types of contracts to be enforceable must be in writing. Some types of contract clauses to be enforceable must be presented in certain types of lettering, or this is how the law was written at the time. Similarly, some types of communications must be witnessed or must be signed. And so that gets us into the problem, as you see in the next area, electronic signature. How do we know that an electronic signature will be given equal treatment at law with a handwritten signature? And fourth, the problem generally of identity trust services, the problem here is liability. How can we rationalize the liability of people who are providing trust services because trust services are a core feature of public key infrastructure? How do we get a certificate to bind the identity of a signatory? Well, you have a certificate. Well, who issues the certificate? Suddenly, we're into this problem of what kind of liability could a certificate issuer face? When you bundle all of these problems together, what you got were a wide variety of laws adopted all around the world, and they're called various things, digital signature laws, electronic signature laws, electronic document laws. They have a blinding array of titles. And if you want to read a lot about these and get right down to uh, grips with it, 
I can think of no finer source than the work of Stephen Mason, which I cite in one of the endnotes in particular. He cited a couple of times in Cybok, but his work on trying to collect and describe these various digital signature laws around the world, I think is really unparalleled. Now I want to take a moment to talk about other regulatory matters. The title of this section really doesn't do the subject justice. Basically, I was trying to find a way to draw together a number of different disparate regulations that are specifically focused around some type of subject matter. Some of these are so significant that a cybersecurity practitioner might spend 10 years of their career working on an issue that revolves around just one of these. So for example, if we look at industry-specific regulation, financial services regulation, regulation of professions, regulating public utilities, all of these are regulatory regimes that predate our understanding of cybersecurity. All of these have been adopted for important public purposes. As time has gone on, each of these industry regulators have begun to understand that cybersecurity is one of the more significant things that can influence the stability of their regulated firms. As a result, many of them have gone to differing lengths to try to direct their industry on how to deal with cybersecurity. Some of them have been a bit hesitant to jump in. Some of them have gone further faster. I suspect that financial services regulators were in a little sooner than others. Within Europe, this prompted the adoption of the NIS directive, which the quickest way to think about that is that it is a directive trying to increase regulatory scrutiny all across the European Union with respect to critical national infrastructure. As we turn our attention to consumer products, we find different types of regulation. The European Union's recent Cybersecurity Act has created a framework to try to regulate the security of products in this space, and there are also traditional regulators like the U.S. Federal Trade Commission, which has a long history of trying to regulate the safety of consumer products as well as consumer marketing. On the technical standards side, you find a growing number of standards, and I've cited Etsy TS-103645 as an early example of trying to get to grips with what do we want the cybersecurity of consumer products to look like. Now moving to a completely different regime, the problem of dual-use products, products and services that can be used for a military or a non-military purpose, and historically, the one that comes straight to the front, cryptography. Many of us are old enough to remember when cryptography was very, very heavily restricted, very heavily regulated. There were export, there still are actually, export restrictions and import restrictions, restrictions on use. Many of those regulations with respect to cryptography specifically have been significantly reduced as regulators began to appreciate that some type of cryptographic solutions were going to be necessary to create a successful internet. In the US, this breakthrough was facilitated significantly by free speech litigation, which you can read a little bit about. The, the Really, the case I think that is most significant in that is a case called Younger v. Daly, decided in the Sixth Circuit US court in the year 2000. Finally, if we look to a completely different regulatory field, state secrets. I've written almost nothing about this, in part because the rules are very different from place to place. But if you work for a state security agency or you are in receipt of information from a state security agency, you will need to pay extremely close attention to the rules that govern state secrets. It's a very, I don't need to tell you, it's a very serious thing that must be complied with. Now I'd like to take a quick look at public international law. Let's start with the basics. Public international law exists to regulate relationships among and between sovereign states. And for this purpose, we include international governmental organizations, treaty organizations, like the United Nations. Where do you find public international law? It's found in treaties, custom, widely accepted norms, decisions of international tribunals. The trick with public international law is how do you enforce it? 
yes, there are international courts, but those courts have very limited power to impose their will onto sovereign states. And the truth of the matter is that states most often have to resort to a type of self-help. They enforce international law against each other. Very often that's taken by means of what we call countermeasures. How does international law apply to cyber operations? Well, let's be upfront about one thing. There is, to my knowledge, no existing international treaty on how states are supposed to treat each other in cyberspace. What we do have is a very long and well understood body of international law that regulates how states treat each other anyway. Most states today seem to agree that existing international law applies to cyber operations, but they don't necessarily agree how to interpret that law in the context of cyber operations. That leads us immediately to the Talon Manual, specifically the Talon Manual 2.0. This is the world's leading source of expert analysis on how international law applies to cyber operations. Some of you will already be familiar with the Talon Manual. It was written by a group of expert international lawyers. The project was funded by NATO, but it does not constitute official NATO doctrine. And for that matter, I don't know of any single state that adopts the Talon Manual as a definitive statement of international law. It is, however, a regular foundational source that people use to try to inform their understanding of how international law applies to cyber operations. That's why it is very extensively cited in CYBOC. Someday we may find a number of decisions by international tribunals or the UN Security Council that will help inform our understanding of how international law applies to cyber operations. Until then, this is the best single source that we have. Now, don't get me wrong, there are many good sources of argumentation and academic scholarship in the field of international law, and I've cited a number of them in CYBOC. There are many, many more available. Each of them represents the opinion of perhaps one or two people. The strength of Talon is that it represents the opinion of a wide group of experts who came down to try to hammer out what they thought was the co lowest common denominator understanding. A common problem in dealing with international law, especially in cyber operations, is the problem of state attribution. In other words, how can we prove that a given act is the responsibility of a given state? Attribution really can be thought of in two different forms. There is the legal standard used to assess whether or not an action should be attributed to a state. And then there's the process of forensic investigation to try to gather evidence used to satisfy that legal standard. In CYBOC, I'm only speaking about the legal standard. And one of the strengths of Talon 2.0 is that they greatly expanded their coverage of how to understand attribution of state action. The three basic theories of attributing action to a state is number one, if an act is actually undertaken by an agent of the state. So if a particular cyber operation was undertaken by a person wearing a military uniform, sitting at their desk in a military base, then it's pretty clear that that action is attributable to the state where they are uh, an officer or agent. The second gets a little bit more confusing, and that is a circumstance where a sovereign state might encourage or indeed direct a non-state agent to undertake a cyber operation. Here we're talking about states who either contract with service providers who undertake operations for them, or alternatively, where states perhaps informally encourage groups with whom they don't have a, a contract necessarily, but nonetheless kind of encourage them along. It was sort of like hints and suggestions. It would be a good idea if you and your friends would attack something or undertake a certain type of operation. That type of encouragement suggests that a state should be responsible for the actions that they've encouraged. And finally, 
One of the more controversial theories in Talon is this idea that a failure to exercise due diligence over cyber infrastructure can lead to responsibility for the state that doesn't look after its own backyard. And this is the theory that if you as a state are unable to police your cyber infrastructure, or if you turn a blind eye to all the awful activity that's emanating from your cyber infrastructure over there in your state, if you do it long enough and seriously enough, then we, the rest of the world, it should be fair for us to attribute the bad actions coming out of your state to you because you have failed to put an end to it. Not everybody agrees with that principle, and you can read more about the argument around this both in Talon 2.0, and there's a fascinating article that I've cited on that point as well. In each of these three legal standards, think for a moment, what kind of evidence would I need to get? What would I have to gather and present in order to prove that that standard had been met? How can I tell if somebody wearing a uniform of that state was actually directing the operation? How can I prove to policymakers, to the international community, that a given state had encouraged a disconnected organization? So that is the problem of forensic investigation. And unfortunately, where confusion arises is when people use the word attribution, they think only about the evidence gathering, and they don't necessarily think about the legal standard that they're trying to meet. Basically, when you look at international law, it's designed to limit how states deal with each other. It's designed to limit and rein and hold back exercises of state power. So basic prohibitions. A state is not supposed to violate the sovereignty of another state. A state is not supposed to use force against another state or make an armed attack against another state. You can see that each of these is increasingly more severe. Well, what constitutes a violation of sovereignty in the age of cyberspace? Different people come to different conclusions about that. And there's some discussion of, there's a lot of discussion of this in Talon 2.0. Use of force. Now, this is an area where there seems to be a bit of convergence about what we're talking about. Basically, if you see a kinetic effect out in the real world, if a cyber operation directly causes something in the physical world to be damaged or a person in the physical world to be harmed, then it probably amounts to what international lawyers call a use of force. Finally, an armed attack, something much worse. So what happens when a state does one of these things, uses force or makes an armed attack without justification? That leads us to the subject of countermeasures. Countermeasures are a knowing violation of international legal principles in an effort to remedy or let's say, get back at a state that has itself violated international legal principles. And this becomes a very dangerous game. One of the key ideas behind the law of countermeasures is that countermeasures must be proportional. So if somebody does, if a state does something kind of a little bit bad to my state, then my countermeasure has to be down at that limit of only kind of a little bit bad in response. And countermeasures, of course, to a cyber operation don't have to be a cyber countermeasure. That leads to a problem that nobody seems to have an answer to right now, which is how do you compare the severity of a cyber attack with the severity of a non-cyber countermeasure? At what point does a cyber attack justify an economic sanction? At what point does a cyber attack justify a kinetic response. Finally, if states are actually in armed conflict with each other, then a slightly different set of international legal principles starts to come into play. And the four principles that are always cited in this area are that armed conflict, when you're making a decision about what to do in the middle of an armed conflict, how far can you go? How much force can you use? How hard can you hit? The principles are you should only go, you should only do things to the degree that they are necessary for legitimate military objectives. You have to respect what's called the principle of humanity, which is you should not do 
You should not cause more human suffering than is strictly necessary. The principle of distinction. You should target military objectives and not non-military objectives. And proportionality. Once again, the amount of force that you use has to be proportional to the circumstances. Now, how do you apply any of these principles or all of these principles in a cyber environment is something that we'll probably have to learn in the decades to come. In particular, you might want to have a bit of reading on the subject of distinction, because so many of the state's functions have now been transferred into cloud service operations. There is a lot that's been written about how do we tease apart the difference between a military and a non-military objective when you have certain types of state functions or military functions that might be co-located in a cloud instantiation of some type. And now we turn to a discussion of ethics. Why should cybersecurity practitioners adhere to some sort of code of conduct? What is the case for a code of conduct? Why, why is this a good idea? Why should we have them? First of all, cybersecurity practitioners are often placed into positions of trust. They're given preferential access or administrative access or root access to sensitive systems, business systems and government systems. The activities of cybersecurity practitioners often take place behind closed doors, out of the glare of public scrutiny. Cybersecurity practitioners are working with a set of special knowledge and special skills. All of these factors tend to suggest that a practitioner could have asymmetric power in a client relationship. It could be that all of these other points about acting outside public scrutiny with special knowledge and skills placed in a position of trust gives them unwarranted power over their client. And finally, people with these skills, whether they're acting as consultants or information security officers or operational folks or conducting research, there's a lot of potential that their actions could result in harm to members of the public. You put all five of these points together, and this is a classic formulation that says, this is a function that should be subject to some type of agreed code of conduct, some type of agreed code of ethics. That's a challenge because, to be candid, there aren't very many out there. What is it that we should have in a code of conduct? What is it that makes a code a good code? Well, in my opinion, first of all, a good code of conduct would have detailed guidance on how to interpret and apply the principles that are expressed in a code of conduct. It's one thing to put up high-minded principles. It's another thing to know how to apply them. A good code of conduct should address the relationship between a practitioner and their client, as well as between the practitioner and society as a whole, and try to give some guidance on how to balance these two relationships. These can be put in tension, and a lot of practitioners regularly face tension between what they believe is their obligation to society and what they believe is their obligation to a client. And when that relationship is examined, remember this. We want clients to be able to trust cybersecurity practitioners, and how do we facilitate that trust? Third, what makes a good code of conduct? Adoption and support by a well-defined community of practitioners. If a code of conduct is simply written by three or four experts and published without any kind of debate, I think that the resulting code will not be well respected and will not be taken up particularly strongly. What makes a code particularly strong is if there are many voices involved in the debate and the people in the field themselves are involved in helping to set the standards. Now, examples that I believe are worthy of study that I've cited are the ACM Code of Ethics and Professional Conduct. These were significantly changed or revised in 2018, and that revision process took some time. I like the ACM Code of Ethics and Professional Conduct because it's built around a community of people who have similar skills, people who work in computing. And it's a fascinating examination because the 2018 Code of Ethics talks extensively about ethics in the cyber age. The preceding code from the early 1992 barely mentions the internet at all. A very different code of conduct can be found with CREST. 
and I mentioned this in Cyblock as well, the Crest Code of Conduct is built around a community of people delivering a similar business process or a similar business service. Specifically, the Crest Code began with a group of people who were delivering penetration testing services, and they've now grown along a number of business service lines. So the two codes are interesting because they have different design ideals, or they are designed for different types of community. The first is a community based around technical expertise, and the second is a community, although reliant on technical expertise, that's built around similar business process. I think it's really hard to talk about ethics in cybersecurity without mentioning vulnerability testing and disclosure. When we look at vulnerability testing, there is unfortunately a lack of consensus on how to tell the difference between research and computer crime. Now, I know that not everyone's going to agree with that, but if you want to see some evidence of it, how is it that we routinely talk about white hat, black hat, and then worst of all, gray hat hackers? The very names themselves suggest that we're finding it difficult to understand what is appropriate or inappropriate research methodology. And even when you get to sort of the, the ivory tower of, of the academy of higher education, you sometimes stumble into situations where people arguably get the calculation wrong. It's very, very difficult. Secondly, vulnerability disclosure. This is where a lot of the shooting and a lot of the fighting happens, frankly. There's a lack of practitioner consensus on the process of responsible disclosure. There's also lack of consensus on whether or not disclosure should be held off indefinitely, which is to say, should something not be disclosed. There's a lot of ongoing discussion and argument about state security agencies, the ones who talk about balancing equities, responsible release, etc. And I've cited some of these in Cybok. Finally, there's a lot of differing practice on how to deal with the subject of bug bounties, people who want to monetize vulnerability. Slowly, some consensus seems to be building around the value of a bug bounty program, but then there's a lot of cases where you just are trying to figure out what's the appropriate thing to do. The difference between a researcher who offers a vulnerability because they've found it to somebody who has a published bug bounty program and says, I'd, I'd like my bounty, please, as opposed to somebody who goes to an organization that doesn't have one and says, oh, I found a vulnerability, and wouldn't it be nice if you gave me a lot of money to disclose it to you? There, there's a very, very uncomfortable boundary between legitimate research and responding to requests for bugs and, well, just a shakedown. Finally, don't overlook the last point. Vendor action, vendor responsibility. One of the most frustrating things about vulnerability disclosure is when disclosures are made to vendors and then they do nothing. They should do something. In fact, there seems to be industry consensus on what they should do. You can find it in these two ISO standards that talk about how to set up a process for receiving vulnerability reports, just being made aware of vulnerabilities, and then how to action a vulnerability. Unfortunately, although there appears to be some consensus in these two ISO standards, there's lack of implementation across the board in the vendor community. Finally, let's have a word about legal risk management. I'm going to go back to this formula that I presented in section one. Remember that the formula was designed to try to tease out the different things that you need to think about in terms of assessing legal risk. Well, that's when you're assessing legal risk of something that's already happened. You know, yes, we want to follow the rules and we should follow legal rules. At the same time, we make a risk decision. Will uh, a person be willing to enforce rules? Will What do we have at stake if a rule is enforced? Are there affirmative defenses that means that we have particular rights to do something? So we start with that, and then we start looking at these other forward-looking points. In trying to risk manage law, first of all, I suggest look for subject matter areas of greatest risk. No matter what type of organization you're working in, there will be some areas of law, some areas of regulation that frankly matter more than others. Always think about impact on human life. If you're involved in anything that might put human life at risk, you must pay much closer attention to your obligations. 
due diligence. How do you even find out which laws you're supposed to comply with? Well, try to figure out which areas of law are most important and which states are most likely to enforce those laws. And that's where you conduct due diligence to try to find out what the law says, how the law works, and align your operations with that. Think about the practical limits of enforcement jurisdiction. Also, consider costs of breaching, non-criminal, obligations. When we talked about contracts, I mentioned that one of the limitations with contracts is that people make a calculation, a business calculation, how much will it cost me to simply ignore this thing that I've agreed to do? And if the answer is very, very small, they might walk away from that obligation. As an individual practitioner, think long and hard about risk to your personal liberty, your safety, and your reputation. Anyone who works in the field of cybersecurity hits a point at some point in their career where they're asked to do something that's illegal. It might be a small crime or it might be a big crime. It might be in the state where you live or it might be in the state that you're visiting. Remember, your life, your liberty, your reputation is on the line. Think about likelihood of enforcement, particularly for non-criminal cases. Think about challenges of collecting and preserving and presenting evidence in terms of, if, particularly if you're working with a trading program or something like that, think about how will I justify the decisions that I've made today about our cybersecurity activities? If we are later sued for negligence, if we are later sued for uh, a breach of contract, think about vicarious liability. What kind of liability will our employees bring to our organization? How do we influence the behavior of our employees in order to reduce the organization's liability? Think about localizing risky activity in separate companies, separate legal persons. Now, this is the type of activity that you'll probably have to engage a corporate lawyer to figure out how to do. A lot of cyber risk has been reduced by simply sticking it in a completely separately capitalized subsidiary or a sister company and taking it off the books of the company that must be preserved. Think about risks that are external to legal enforcement system entirely. Reputation, loss of business, bad public relations. Nobody wants to be this week's headline on CNN because of a, a, a cyber disaster of some type. And then most difficult of all, try to think about changes in law or policy that are likely to come up sometime in the future. Keep an eye on the direction, on the trend of laws that are being adopted and laws that are being enforced. I hope you've enjoyed this quick walk through the contents of CYBOC Law and Regulation Knowledge Area. Please feel free to communicate with me if you want to correspond on subjects arising.